So let's take a look at the Samaritans now. So as we said before, you know, they're definite enemies of the uh, Pharisees. The Samaritans were a mixed population who worshiped God in a very different way from the Jews. And the Jews refused to have anything to do with the Samaritans. But Jesus shocks everybody. Why? Because he speaks to them. He speaks to the Samaritans. So between Judea and Galilee, there was Samaria, and that's where the Samaritans lived. So throughout the Gospels, we hear about them. This, their, their name is, is constantly coming up. And we can tell that most Jews didn't like them. In John chapter 4, verse 9, a Samaritan woman is astonished that Jesus would even speak to her. The, and again, it says, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Well, the reason was the Jews had absolutely no dealings with the Samaritans. So who were they? And why did the Jews hate them so much? Well, when the Assyrians carried off the northern tribes of Israel, they probably left behind some of the poorer population, which was typical. They couldn't get any advantage from them. So they kind of left the poor behind. Right. We know that the Assyrians resettled other exiles from all over their Assyrian empire. Um, uh, rather, uh, they settled them from all over in, in Israel, rather. And we see a reference to that in Second Kings. And those people began to worship the God of Israel alongside their own gods. So again, just, you know, again, one of, the, one of the many gods, they probably intermarried with the Israelite stragglers left behind. That's what everyone believes, is that the ones that were left behind, they went and they went and they married outside of their race, the outside of their nation. There were also poor farmers left behind when Judah was carried off to Babylon. And they have, they may have already mixed with the uh, Samaritan population as well. So the Samaritans of Jesus' time, like the Samaritans today, worship one true God, but in a different way, as we alluded to a few moments ago. Only the five books of Moses are considered scripture by the Samaritans. They don't accept any of the historical books. They don't accept any of the wisdom uh, literature or any of the prophetic writings. Instead of worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem, they worship on Mount Gerizim, near the present city of Nablus, N-A-B-L-U-S, in the Palestinian West Bank. This is where the, um, in John 4, 20, where the Samaritan woman tells Jesus, our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you, and she's meeting the Jews now, you know, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place to worship. They believe that their holy mountain has better claim than Mount Zion, since it was a worship site long before King David conquered Jerusalem. So to the Jews of Jesus's time, the Samaritans were hated heretics. They considered them heretics because they defied God's word as spoken through his prophets. So because they didn't recognize or accept the prophets, well, to the Jews, they, they, they hated them. They considered them to be heretics. So even talking to a Samaritan would um, kind of taint the Jewish person with the Samaritan heresy. In other words, if you were friendly with one of them, well, then you believed what they believed. And so you obviously had to be one of them. So it attached you to it. So it was really shocking now, you know, again, as we start to read about, and we learn about Jesus in the Holy Land, um, we realize that it's really shocking that he speaks to Samaritans. This isn't a small thing. He speaks to Samaritans as though they were human beings which others did not. Now today, there's at most a few hundred Samaritans left. For more than 2,000 years, they have kept their traditions in spite of everything that has happened in Palestine. 
But even now, they still are a persecuted minority. And in the near future, for the few hundred that there are, they might soon just die off and just become a part of history. Any questions so far? All right, let's take a look at a little vocabulary here. We have uh, Aristobulus. He's the Jewish high priest who declared himself king in Jerusalem. He was a Levite, but most importantly, he's not a descendant of David. Now, Galilee, that's the land that had been the northern part of ancient Israel. It's on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. When you go there or in some of your, re uh, your readings, you might see it referred to as the Galilee because it's a region. So we read it both ways, Galilee or the Galilee, it's a region. We have Herod the Great. Herod the Great is a wickedly ambitious king. And with the support of the Romans, he takes over the government of Palestine. And as I said before, he's an Edomite. E-D-O-M-I-T-E. -E. But he painted a picture of himself as being a Jew who returned from exile. John Hyrcanus is the Jewish high priest who conquered almost all the territory of the ancient Davidic kingdom, and he Judaized the whole country. Now the Pharisees. They are a Jewish sect that believed in keeping separate from the Gentiles, which is what their, main, their name means. They followed the law of Moses strictly, and they added many traditional interpretations and regulations of their own. And as we said, keep in mind, when they added these, that was for the rank and file people, certainly not for them. So in essence, the, they had two laws, the laws that the Pharisees kept, and the laws that everybody else was forced to keep. The proselytes of the gate, these are the Gentiles who worshiped the true God and knew the Jewish scriptures, but they were not circumcised and did not keep the whole law of Moses. We then have the Sadducees. This was a Jewish sect that believed in accommodating Judaism to modern life. They held most of the powerful positions in the priesthood. Key element for them is they did not believe in the resurrection. And they also denied the existence of angels and spirits. And then we said the Tetrarchy was the division of Herod's greatest kingdom. And it divided among his four sons. So it meant ruled by four. Okay. Any questions? I'll give you a few moments. I see all heads down and writing. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to get that down. I am accused of having people go out and buy many pens whenever they take any of my courses because they run out of ink very quickly. Okay, let's take a look at Jeremiah. Chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, as we begin talking about the New Testament here. Um, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, 
from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is really a powerful part of scripture. This scripture says a lot of things for us. It says point blank. It reminds uh, it reminds the, uh, the Israelites that God was the one that took them out of Egypt by the hand. All right. He says, I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He says, my covenant, my relationship. Remember we talked about that. My relationship, which they broke though I was their husband, you see. So we see that spousal language again, uh, laced through sacred scripture. And then he says, I will put my law within them. I will write it upon their hearts. Probably one of the easiest ways to think of that is our conscience, okay? He put the law in our hearts. He gave us the ability to, uh, to distinguish between good and evil. Now it becomes, now you, uh, what be, it, this becomes powerful language because you have what we call covenantal language in the next line. It says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That is covenantal language. And sometimes you see it reversed. They will be my people. I will be their God. That is relation. That's how God views the covenant. I will be their God and they will be my people. And then again, the last line, I will forgive their iniquity. You might want to highlight this one. I will remember their sin no more. So, the New Testament does not replace the Old Testament. And we've said this before. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we many times look at those as two separate entities, two separate books. We look at the Old Testament as the angry God trying to uh, correct everybody. And there's lots of wars and a lot of fighting. And in the New Testament, he goes and takes a Dale Carnegie call, of course, and becomes the friendly God, the happy God. You know, uh, that's not the case. Um, the New Testament doesn't replace the Old Testament. It fulfills the Old Testament. So when I teach this, I say that we have to read the Old Testament through a lens. Because the Old Testament is going to tell us what Jesus is going to fulfill in the New Testament. So as we read those prophecies, we can find them in the New Testament. And also the New Testament has to be uh, read uh, through the lens of the Old. Because when you read about these prophecies that have been fulfilled, you can find them uh, in the Old Testament. See? So again, the, uh, the New Testament fulfills what was prophesied in the Old. See? So St. Augustine said that the New Testament is hidden in the Old and that the Old is revealed in the New. So without the New Testament, the Old Testament is just a collection of difficult stories, tragic stories, unfulfilled promises. But when you look at the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament, we see that the Old Testament is the story of God's gradual unfolding of his plan of salvation. It's a gradual unfolding. Right? The plan that reaches its climax then with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we see each element of the Old Testament linking together as it works its way through the Old Testament and then crosses over into the New, culminating in the salvific work of Jesus Christ. So the Catechism in section 1964 tells us that the Old Law is a preparation for the Gospel. Now keep in mind the Gospel, the word Gospel means good news. So the Old Law is a preparation for the good news. And it says the law is a pedagogy. That's a strange little word. It's P-E-D-A-G-O-G-Y, okay, a pedagogy. So what do we mean by pedagogy? Well, it's, it's a way of teaching. It's a method of teaching is what it is. Every teacher has their own pedagogy, their method of teaching, whatever the subject is that they're teaching. So it's a pedagogy and a prophecy of things to come. So it prophesies and um, 
uh, presages is the word that we use here, the work of liberation from sin, which will be fulfilled in Christ. So Jesus is going to free us from sin. So it provides us, the old law uh, provides the New Testament with images or types okay, and symbols for expressing the life according to the spirit. And we will unpack more of that as we move forward. So how is this New Testament organized? Well, the books of the New Testament can be put in the same class, into the same classes as the books of the Old Testament. First, you have the law or the four gospels. In the Old Testament, the five books of Moses give the old law and the story of the founding of Israel. Well, in the same way, the four gospels give us the new law and the story of the founding of the church which is the new Israel. The second um, point is that the, is the history. And we find that in the Acts of the Apostles. Again, just as the Old Testament beginning in Joshua gives us the history of Israel from the death of Moses, so the Acts of the Apostles gives us the history of the early church from the ascension of Jesus. It is the one true book of history of the church. The apostles. It's not going to find any better. The third is wisdom or the epistles. These are letters that are written by the apostles that tell us how to live as Christians. And the fourth is prophecy. The revelation to John. John brings us the word of the Lord in symbols and images. And he's often retelling or recalling those used in the Old Testament prophets. So we have uh, four classes, the law, the history, the wisdom, and the prophecy. So the new law, the four gospels. I throw out this trick question, and I shouldn't say it's a trick question, but it really is when I'm teaching uh, the sacred scripture course. I ask everyone, how many gospels are there? And inevitably, inevitably everyone yells out four. Well, no, there's only one. There's only one gospel, but it is told four ways. You see? So all four gospels tell the same story. But each gospel writer, as our point says, tells it from a different point of view. And we'll talk about that more. Why? They're writing to it. Each one's writing to a different community. So the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic because they have a similar view. So as I said, when we look at the four gospels, we can see that they all tell the same story, but they tell it from different points of view. Each evangelist, as the gospel writers are called, um, uh, that comes from the word evangel uh, ev evangelium, okay, the good news, it emphasizes different details. Why? Well, because their communities are different. Their audience is different. And the circumstances of life at that particular time were different. So they had to write in a different way. See, so the scholars have suggested uh, many ways in which the three synoptic gospels could be related. The most popular suggestion uh, has been that Mark's gospel was the first of the three, and that Matthew and Luke both used Mark as one of their sources. Okay? So even though we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Mark is considered to be by the scholars uh, the first one. Now, why do, we, why do we say that? Well, when you're looking at the ancient language, Mark's language, Mark's Greek, is very, very rough, not fine-tuned. And it's a very short gospel, okay? it's very, very fine-tuned. When you look at Matthew and Luke, their gospels are much broader. Also, if you are reading it from the ancient language viewpoint, you see that the Greek has really been corrected and polished. Okay? Those of you who are teachers, would appreciate that. You would have looked at the paper your student wrote and said, well, you know, that, that, yeah, okay, I got the idea, but I think that you need to clean up your grammar a bit and fine tune it, you know, and that's exactly what uh, Matthew and Luke did. But also, 
they did what is called an exegesis, E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S, -E -E exegesis. That means you expand on what is being written. So they were filling in some of the blanks, educating the people when they did this. So how did they do it? Well, Matthew and Luke, as I said, use Mark as one of their sources. So they take Mark's gospel and they begin to explain more about it. But then there was a source called the Q source, which is Q-U-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's a German word, the Q source. And this was a source, it's not in existence anymore. No one knows where it went, it disappeared. But this was a, this was a source of where uh, they had little statements or notes of things Jesus said or did, the Q source. So again, when I'm teaching this in sacred scripture, I say it's like a shoebox full of post-it notes. Hey, Jesus did this today. Hey, Jesus did that today. You know, and they kept it, you see. So they use that source as well. But unfortunately for us today, that's no longer around. But we do know that, math, that Matthew and Luke use that source plus Mark, plus again, their own sources as well. And that's why their gospels are longer. And that's why their gospels are longer. If you take, if we do the course, Sacred Scripture Revisited, we would get into that. Actually, the amount of words that are used, the amount of whatever, but that's a different course. So if any of you want to do that as one of our studies uh, one time, we can do that. It's one of the classes we normally teach in the diocese, but it's a good class to understand where the scripture comes from and where how we got it from the very, very early days when it was written on papyrus to how we have it today, but that's a subject for another day. So they took um, this Q source, and as I said, no contemporary person has seen that. We don't know that it's gone, you see. Um, only the scholars can only guess what might have been in it. So th those were the sources that were at their disposal. But no matter how the gospels are, are, were written and what sources they used, we know that they are all true. We know that they are all true. They supplement each other. They never contradict each other. They supplement each other. And together, they tell us not only what Jesus did and said, but they also tell us who he was. They also tell us who he was. And as I've said before, we can read the gospel for many different purposes. We can read it for history. We can read it for to understand the culture. We can understand, uh, read it to um, uh, for the spiritual uh, richness that it has. And so as we're studying it, we have to take a look and see uh, what is our purpose here? You know, what are we looking at? And in one instance, we would study it to see who is this man we call Jesus? Who is this person? And what was his impact on the lives of those he taught? Right? So Let's take a look at Matthew here. Matthew, he's writing to Jewish Christians who were the main audience for his gospel. And he emphasizes Jesus as the true heir to David's kingdom. Now, there's a couple of things here. I'll give you a few little tidbits from my other scripture course that I mentioned, because I have to, to explain who he is. A good part of his audience is all, are also Jews. And he has a um, some trouble with his community because the traditional Jews are saying we were led to believe in the law and we were led to believe that this is the one true God. Now you're telling us Jesus over here is God. Isn't that two gods? What's the deal here? So you see there's some, some debate and discussion going on with his community. So he is emphasizing Jesus as the true heir to David's kingdom. So you do have, as Jesus said in scripture, you do have sister against brother, okay, and children against parents, and parents against children, and grandparents. You have all of this dialogue going on in his audience. So he's writing to that particular audience to help them to understand who Jesus was, you see. So although most scholars believe that Matthew's gospel was partly based on the gospel according to Mark, some believe that it may have been, or some parts of it, uh, uh, the earliest of the four Gospels. But traditionally, the church has taught that this Gospel was written by Matthew, who was also called Levi, the tax collector, who walked away from his desk at the collections office to follow Jesus. And again, Matthew 9, 9 says that 
as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So, so as I said, Matthew's gospel is written mostly for Jews. So the most important thing for Matthew is to communicate how Jesus fulfilled their expectations in the Messiah, in the anointed one. So as we've already seen, he begins his gospel with an, a genealogy, a very, very artfully designed genealogy. Why does he do that? To show how Jesus is the ideal successor of David. Genealogies are very critical, very, very important in the Bible. And it might even just be a short reference, like John, the son of Zebedee. Why is it in there? To tell you, to make direct connection. So whenever we see these names of different people, there's a reason they put that in there. It wasn't like, hey, I got some extra paper space here, so let me write in some family names, and you know that way they'll know they'll know who's who. No, there's a reason for it. So he puts these genealog this genealogy in, very very well done, to show how Jesus is the ideal successor of King David. So over and over again, Matthew uses Old Testament scripture to remind us, to remind his audience that Jesus is the son of David, the Christ, the anointed one, okay? The anointed one who has been promised by all the prophets. That's his common thread. That's important to his audience. So all of, of all the gospel writers, Matthew is the one who most lets Jesus speak for himself. The famous Sermon on the Mount, for example, takes up three whole chapters. That's a beautiful uh, meditation. Takes up three whole chapters. And in those three whole chapters, you will notice Matthew never interrupts with his own words. He simply reports what Jesus said. Now that should make you want to turn to that again and read it again. In other words, he's not putting in his two cents. He is telling you exactly what Jesus, he simply reports what Jesus said. He has no input whatsoever. Now in Mark, Mark is dealing with Roman Christians. That's his main audience. And he's emphasizing Jesus as the leader of a new exodus. Now, Peter, was Mark's main source for the stories of Christ's life. And many scholars believe that Mark's gospel, as I said, was the earliest of the four. And so also many believe that Mark or John Mark is what his name is, uh, and he, that's referenced in scripture as, as well. Uh, John Mark is a disciple of Peter and believed to be uh, his scribe or his secretary, right? So John Mark was a disciple who followed Peter to Rome. And then later, according to tradition, according to tradition, he goes to Egypt and he's very close to Peter. Actually, Peter refers to him at the end of his first letter, Peter's first letter in chapter five, verse 13, Peter calls him my son, Mark. So they're very, very close. They're very close. So Mark wrote his gospel based on the stories that Peter had told him. And the main audience is, it's believed that the main audience was probably the Gentile Christians in Rome. So one tradition has it that Peter was so pleased with Mark's work that he had copies of Mark's gospel made for all the churches. Of the four gospels, as I said before, Mark's is the shortest. And that's why the many scholars believe it is the earliest. And as I said, Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Luke rather, used it as a source for writing their own. And having said that, where they agree with Mark, where Luke and Matthew agree with Mark, the writing that they have is word for word, or the pericope as we put it, okay? Remember that word, P-E-R-I-C-O-P-E, -E. it's a verse, but we call it a pericope. The, the, so where they agree, it's word for word. Uh, where they don't agree or have stories of their own, they are stories of their own. But so you can see where they have lifted from Mark because it 
quotes directly. All right. So uh, in all three synoptic gospels, we see those common threads. So Mark's gospel tells the story of Jesus's life in a straightforward way. As a matter of fact, we say that Mark's gospel is the passion of Christ with a brief introduction. He's focusing on Jesus's salvific work. Now, although it includes many of the words of Jesus, he's more interested, Mark is more interested in what Jesus did. So what do we see through here? Throughout, we see Jesus leading us. He's leading us, who we are, the new Israel. He's leading us on a new exodus. He's leading us on the path to the kingdom. He's leading us out of the life of sin. Now, Mark includes one odd little story that none of the other Gospels uh, tell. After Jesus had been arrested, the authorities led him off to the high priest. And in Mark chapter 14, 51 to 52, he says, And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So why does he include this odd little story, this embarrassing little incident? Most scholars believe that the naked young man was Mark himself, who added this little story to remind people who knew him that he was an eyewitness to the events. Mark's favorite word is immediately. Everything in Mark happens now, right now. Immediately. So immediately something happened. And he uses it more than 40 times in his gospel. That's important for him. So reading Mark's gospel straight through at one sitting is easy. It's a good way to understand how exciting the good news must have been to the early believers because it's, it's rapid fire. This is happening, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. Now, symbolically, this story about the, um, the man running off and the cloth is ripped, symbolically, uh, we talked about allegory and reading allegorically. Uh, uh, scholars have said that what has happened there is when Jesus was taken away, now that cloth that the man would have worn would have been protection for him. When Jesus is taken away, the protection is ripped away. Protection is ripped away. Right? But again, that's that allegory story is something for another time. Uh, but uh, when we get into some of those, we'll talk more about how allegory is used, uh, good, bad, or indifferent in reading sacred scripture. Any questions on Mark at all? I am going to encourage you to uh, to look into, or we can decide to do it maybe as a Bible study, uh, the Sacred Scripture Revisited course, because we will go deeper into Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and whatever uh, at another time. We can talk about that. Um, this Our studies now will take us up to our summer break. We could talk about that when we're done with this overview of the entire Bible and see how we want to do that, if we want to do it. Anyway, Luke. Luke's writing to Gentile Christians. They were his main audience. He includes details of Jesus's conception and birth that aren't found anyplace else. And it is believed that Mary, Christ's own mother, may have been Luke's source for those details. Now, I like to preach from Luke because Luke's audience is like ours. They have become kind of complacent. He's constantly reminding them to attend liturgy, okay, how to go to church. Uh, they're pretty comfortable in their ways. They kind of like to sit home in their comfortable chairs, uh, tune in on their favorite TV show, or uh, even though they didn't have TV, I'm just painting a little picture for you here, tune in their favorite sports game or whatever. So Luke's constantly after them, you see. And that's why I say I like to preach Luke because his audience is very similar to us. And that's how we have become sometimes. You know, do we really want to go to mass? Do I really have to go? You know, as a matter of fact, there's a great book for youth. It's called, Do I Really Have to Go? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, that talks about why we have to go to mass, even though it's, it's uh, written with a focus on the uh, young, young adults. Uh, it's good for us as well. Like, why do we go? What do we have to do? That's, his, that's what he's wrestling with. But the beautiful thing here is that Mary is probably 
his resource. Why? He gives us the story of Mary and Gabriel. Well, where would he have gotten that since it was just Mary and Gabriel? There was nobody hiding behind a rock with a notepad. So where would he have gotten that story? You see? So it comes directly from her. Now, I think that's, that's kind of neat. Can you picture uh, Luke uh, sitting down with a, uh, a strong cup of um, Hebrew coffee, interviewing Mary? I, don't, I just think that the, I just, uh, my mind just goes off into different patterns with this every once in a while. And I could just picture them just sitting down somewhere, and she's telling him these stories. And he's writing these stories and, and, and just because and they she would be the only one that knows them. And she communicates to them and he, she communicates them to him. You see, so again, uh, St. Paul calls Luke the beloved physician. And we know from the Acts of the Apostles, which he also wrote, he'd probably be very upset with us today because he would have liked the book of Acts to come right after his own book, his own gospel. But in the laying out of the canon, we separated it. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, and then Acts, Acts comes down the pike. But he wrote the two of them. And he spent a lot of time traveling with Paul and the others. And so from his own writing, we can tell he's very, very educated. And again, if you knew the ancient language, you would see that he writes in the finest Greek, very highly polished Greek, you know, correcting the grammar, correcting the words, you know. Uh, understand exactly what was being said. He's a well-educated man, and he had mastered all of the literary, literary techniques of the best writers of the day. So he wrote mainly, as I said, to Gentile converts. So he, he emphasizes Jesus's ministry to all the nations, all the nations. So when he wrote his gospel, many other narrations of Jesus's life had already been written. And so why does he need to write another one? Well, he probably had two reasons. Okay? Um, first, he emphasizes that he wants to give an orderly account. If you read right from the opening of Luke's gospel, he tells the people, there's a lot out there. And I've read it all. Okay, you, you figure he, he's read Mark. You know, he's read uh, Paul. Paul's writing in the year 45. You know, so again, Luke's writing much later, you know, so he's letting everyone know he's read everything that's out there. And he says, you know, that um, he wants to give an orderly account. Now he's well respected. So he's going to go A, B, C, D, E. He's giving them an orderly account. All right. So that probably means that Luke, with all of his education, thought that the other accounts about Jesus were not necessarily written in the best order got the information, but not necessarily in the best order. We don't know whether his version is strictly chronological, but we knew that, that we know that he's a careful historian. So what he made sure was that he was giving his readers the proper historical setting for each story. We're not saying it's chronologically correct. What we're saying is that he historically, yes, he went and he researched and he says that if you open up um, the, uh, the Gospel of Luke, he says that right in the beginning. I have read everything and I am giving you an orderly account, right? So again, so that, that again, that means that he has thrown all of his experience at his writing. Now, the second is that he had information that none of the other Gospels writers had, especially about Christ's conception and birth. In all the four Gospels, only Luke gives us the, um, the, uh, the familiar stories of the Annunciation, the baby in the manger, the visit of the shepherds, and Jesus' teaching in the temple when he was 12. Only him. So where does he get them? Got to get them from Mary. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Joseph said that Joseph isn't referred to. You know, after, after finding Jesus in a temple, Joseph disappears. So where does he get him from? He gets them from talking with Mary. So, again, um, we look at Luke chapter 2, 19, which brings all of this, just one little line. 
really sheds a lot of light on what Luke is writing. And he says, but Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. And again, we look at chapter two, verse 51, and his mother kept all these things in her, in her heart. Isn't that beautiful? When you realize that he's the only one that has stories like this. So Mary opens up her heart to Luke. And she tells him these secrets that she has kept on her heart all these years. I think that that's magnificent to me anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that, that, that adds an excitement to sacred scripture that is, I don't know, you, 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 can't, you can't tie it down. You can't tie, you know, here we've heard all through scripture. Huh? She, she didn't understand it, so she hangs on to it, keeps it in her heart, keeps it in her heart. And then Luke shows up. He's the 60 minutes program of the day, okay? The Mike Wallace of the day. He sits down and interviews her. And wow, what does she do? All these things she's pondered in her heart, she tells him. And he writes them down and brings them to us. You see, so again, who but Mary could have told the things that she kept in her heart? Nobody else knew them, you see? So um, Luke may have made comments like this to explain why his gospel contained information that is not found in any other accounts of the other writers or any other accounts of Jesus's life. Now we know that Luke was with the apostle time as Mary. Mary. So if he had decided to write an orderly account of Jesus's life, it would have been natural for him to say, hey Mary, yeah, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Yeah. You know, can we have a chat? You know, uh, yeah. it would have been natural, you see. And again, the catechism at 2600 gives us a reference here as well. And it says, the gospel according to St. Luke emphasizes the action of the Holy Spirit and the meaning of prayer in Christ's ministry. Jesus prays before the decisive moments of his mission, before his father's witness to him during his baptism and transfiguration, and before his own fulfillment of the father's plan of love by his passion. He also prays before the decisive moments involving the mission of his apostles at his election and at the call of the 12, before Peter's confession of him as the Christ of God, and again, uh, that the faith of the chief of the apostles may not fall when tempted, Jesus' Jesus's prayer before the events of salvation that the fire Father has asked him to fulfill is a humble and trusting commitment of his human will to the loving will of the Father. Where does he get this? Where does he get this? Again, Jesus, uh, Luke rather, has a definite connect there with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And that's where he gets his information. So again, right in the beginning of his gospel, and I encourage you to read that, just turn to the first page of Luke's gospel after our class today, and you'll see, he outlines it. He tells everyone, I know all this stuff is out there, and I've read it all. Now I'm going to give you an orderly account of what's going on. Any questions on, on Luke? Okay. Let's take a look at John. Now, when we study the Gospels, we can study the Synoptic Gospels together. And part of that scripture course I mentioned to you, we do that Sacred Scripture Revisited and, and the Synoptic Gospels. Um, and if we were to do a shorter version of that course, we could do the Synoptic Gospels on their own. But John, you can't study with the Synoptic Gospels because he's a different writer, you see. He writes with what we call a higher Christology, a higher Christology. He em emphasizes Jesus as the word of God incarnate. He focuses on the divinity of Jesus, where the other synoptic gospels are focusing more on the passion, you see. And um, the, uh, the passion, the crucifixion of Jesus is seen as a disgraceful death, a terrible way to die. When you flip to John, who writes at this higher, higher Christology, John views the cross as the throne from which Jesus reigns. It's a different view. So you can't study the, the all the four together, right? Uh, he also stresses our new creation in Christ. And he too fills in details that are left out by the other three. And again, the family relationship of the Trinity 
is revealed most completely in John, as your point says there. So the Gospel of John itself tells us that it was written by the disciple whom Jesus loved. Jesus' best friend, John. Tradition tells us that John lived to be very old. And most scholars believe that his gospel was the last of the four to be written. To John, the most important thing is to remind his readers that Jesus was truly God incarnate. That's his whole point. That he is truly the word of God who had existed with God from the beginning. That's his focus. Now, John's gospel was probably written mostly for Jewish Christians, since it's filled with allusions to Old Testament events. And also it's linked to uh, Old Testament symbols that only the Jewish readers would understand. So that's John. Now, there's some interesting stories about John as well. And it, it, as I said, I, when, I, when I read the history of, of, um, of the evangelists or the history of the martyrs, it amazes me sometimes uh, what the people who are putting the man up for water, martyrdom don't see. I mean, here they try to boil John in oil and they throw him in this huge vat of boiling oil and he gets out, just steps out. Nobody is stunned by that. I mean, really? You know, you know, did he jump out and say, hey, anybody have some dawn so I can get this oil off my body? What's the deal here? Nobody's amazed by this at all. It's like, hey. And, and so he ends up on Patmos, which is a, um, uh, a, an exile, an island of exile, prison island. See. But when you look at what John, or actually any of them, but John especially, where they try to kill him with the boiling oil and it doesn't succeed, and I always scratch my head at that story as to, didn't that like, <clears throat> surprise anybody? Didn't they find that to be a, just a little odd that, that, that the boiling oil that you could fry chicken in two seconds, um, you know, would not have touched him? I, I just find that amazing. But even with the Old Testament, I also find it amazing. You know, God parts the Red Sea and it's like, oh, what else you got for us? You know, it's, I, it, just, it, it just amazes me. And I think that's an important point for us when we are reading sacred scripture or praying sacred scripture to understand that uh, the writers, the people of the time are no different from us. They're no different from us. You know, you go to mass and uh, as a matter of fact, Deacon Mike Pleva, um, who is assigned to us until his ordination, which will be in this May, there are two Deacon Michaels at St. Benedict. And so uh, I address him as a uh, Deacon Younger, and I am Deacon Elder, so people don't confuse us, you know. So anyway, we were talking last week about the amount of people that actually leave Mass after communion, or definitely before the priest is even off the altar. So we're no different than the people that the evangelists are writing to. Luke's audience, John's audience, do you know, John writing, do you know who this is? You have an idea where you are. You know who this is. You see, so that's the lens we have to look through when we read scripture. And that's the lens for those of us that preach <clears throat> or give reflections. That's the lens that we have to look through when we're preparing them. Because do you really know who you are, where you are, rather? Do you know what's going on here? You know, do you know that, you know, heaven opens to earth at this mass? Are you aware, are you kind of, are you aware of that? Uh, also, you know, if you read the, the detailed story of the Last Supper, um, after Jesus broke the bread and they had the bread and they drank the wine that he gave, um, I didn't read anywhere that anybody left early, except Judas. Judas is the one that left early, but nobody got up and left. When you invite people to your home for dinner, do they in the middle of dinner say, well, but nice, see you later. No, they usually hang out at least till it's over with, you know. So and that's, that's the teaching that we have to take from our, 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 um, our Bible study, our sacred scripture. That's what we have to bring to the people. Do you understand what this is? Do you realize what this is? You know? And why would you want to leave? Why would you want to leave? You know? 
and, and, again, and again, those of the deacons that are in this class, you know that when you're up there preaching, you look out there and people are looking at their watch. You know, you see it. You can tell when they roll their, you know, push their sleeve up and they look down, you know, that they're, 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 you're going past your eight minutes, you know, so be careful and move it along. That, that's it. You know, and that's really sad. That, that, that's really quite sad. But as we study our, our sacred scripture going forward, we're going to see the importance of what's happening here, what we have in our hands. And I'm going to leave that there today. And now what we have in our hands is the word of God written in the words of man so we can understand it. Do we have any questions at all? Anybody have any questions before we close for today? No, I don't see any. Yes. Yeah, Amy. I can see, I can't hear anything yet. But Sorry, I'm trying to get off. Yeah. I'm trying to get my mouse working, but my, my mouse fault. Yeah, I have got one of these new um, mouse that it will go to sleep on you. So I'm trying to wake up my mouse here and ask the question. What was the reference to Jeremiah that you um, started with, with the covenantal language? I missed that one um, right before you started. About Jeremiah, the... Jeremiah 31. Okay. 31 to 34. And you'll see that elsewhere as well, the phraseology, whenever you see it. Okay? And, yes. and again, if any of you are electors and you get to read at mass and you see that language, I, mean, I, I would love to get to train all the lectors, but I don't think that in my lifetime will happen. But um, I'd love to train them to pause and slow down. If you understand what that is, when you see that, when you're prepping at home and you see that, when you get up and you are going to read sacred scripture at mass, stop before you say it. It's that powerful. I will be your God. You will be my people. That's a, don't blow over that. That is really, really important. See, or if it's the reverse, you will be my people. I will be your God. Why? That in that short context, God is explaining that He wants with us a relationship. That's it. And we call it covenantal language. It's the language of the covenant. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. It's yeah. Melissa. I just, I really just have a comment. And it's funny because I had the same question Amy had, but I knew when you were reading it, it sounded so familiar to me. So I just went back in my lecture book and found it because I had just read that, I think a couple, like right before Easter. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was reading that week. And I know that when that does come up and it tells us when we're reading, you know, in the lecture book, it references that you do that. And I always try to make sure to do that because I think it is for me personally, just very powerful. So um, I think that's interesting. And the other comment that I wanted to make when you were talking about homilies and people, you know, kind of looking at their watches, like I know I've been there before in my life, but one thing that I started practicing for not quite a year now, um, I had received a mass journal from Dynamic Catholic, mm -hmm. and I've been utilizing that, where it's just, I mean, you can use any kind of book, but this is specifically a little book that's numbered for each week. And the purpose is, you know, uh, Matthew Kelly says, God, please show me one thing in this mass that will make me a better person this week. And so I find myself as a student of mass that week, whether it is most especially the readings and the homily, but sometimes something in the song that I'm, it causes me to tune in more to pull that one thing that God is speaking to me about in that mass. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a very, yeah, it's a very good, very good exercise, a very good way to make sure that you are focusing on where you are and what's happening when you're there. You know, so yes, I think that's an excellent idea. And there are some people in our parish that I noticed that uh, they're writing something, you know, they're either writing a letter to the bishop that this lunatic is preaching, or, or they are, um, they're taking notes on something that I'm saying, but I see that every once in a while, I glance out there, and I see people writing things down. And I think that is that, that yeah, I think that that's a very good, uh, uh, good way to, um, uh, to, to feel God touching you, feel God speaking to you. Nancy and I went to Korea quite a few years ago to visit our daughter-in-law's family. And we had the pleasure of attending mass 
but on two different Sundays, we were there that long and, and at two different Catholic churches. And the interesting thing there was that as the priest was preaching, many of the people had notebooks. Those that didn't were taking notes around the perimeters of their bulletin. And we were really surprised because it wasn't just a few, it was many. And it was of both of the churches that we went to. And we were, uh, we, we commented later on at the, um, first off the reverence that the people had. Every woman had a head covering. Uh, everybody had their hands folded like this, not just those at the altar. And they were taking notes. It was like, wow, this is really good. And then also no one left when mass ended. You know, like Nancy whispered to me and she said, you know, do we leave now? I said, no. Uh, just sit here. Nobody's moving. So we'll just sit and see what happens. Well, what happened then was the choir director came out and he led them in prayer. I'm thinking it might have been the prayer of St. Michael. You know, the priest had left the altar, but he led them in prayer for a few minutes and then everybody exited the church. But nobody, it was just, it was amazing to us to see that, to see that level of reverence. Uh, and the church, it wasn't um, a holiday time, standing room only. In the churches it wasn't hot and it wasn't a holiday time so this is these are some of the things that again by you sharing what you're learning with the people that you know and your family and friends and whatnot hopefully we can re you know reignite that fire or you know fan that spark a bit and get people back into who we are as catholic christians and what's happening when we are there at the liturgy you know what are we doing and, and also you know, looking for those opportunities where God is tapping us individually on the shoulder and say, I want to listen up. Uh, I think you might, might want to write this down, you know, uh, so that we, we, again, we take that home. And, and I always, I, I always say that, that um, at the end of mass, the priest or the deacon charges you with something. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. And what are we saying when we say that? We're saying, Take what you got in here. If God touched you a certain way, don't keep it to yourself. Take it outside and let the people know how you have been touched. Let the people know how you have been moved. That's the key. So that's really a beautiful way of doing it, Melissa. Uh, and I suggest, yeah, I mean, I certainly don't want to see everybody sitting there with notebooks and laptops, you know, taking down every single note. Uh, but by the sea, yeah, I've come away with something that, that really strikes you and share that with others. I think that's so yeah. And that's, that's kind of what he shares is not to write a whole notebook, but just like one thing, you know, one thing that just you feel God is speaking to you about. So, yeah, it's true. And, and again, I, I do know that people read the, uh, they follow in their missalettes, the sacred scripture, but uh, as a theologian, I would prefer that they put the missalette down when the scripture is being read and they listen to it, mm -hmm. just focus on it. Don't read it. You know, that just focus on it. Because I always pause, because I pause when the, the, the sound of the pages comes across, because it sounds like a wave on the ocean. Everybody turns the page, and I always pause while they turn it, you know, and then I'll start again. Uh, and I really wish that people would just put the missalette down for the reading of sacred scripture and just listen to it, just take it in. And that's why my encouragement to lectors when I do speak with them is to please read slow. And if you think you are reading too slow, read a little slower. You know, so that the people can take it in, you know, because it's, it's so beautiful. So, but uh, those are lessons that we can try to teach out there. And uh, by sharing with what, again, how the, the beauty of the liturgy touches us. Uh, I think that's so very important. So, any other questions or comments before we? See, that's uh, just to, for you, back on your comment there. See, that's different for me because I feel like I want to read it to help understand or to help listen to it so I guess maybe I'll have to try it some, or get into the habit of not looking at the gospel while it's being read to try to listen better but for me right now I read it to try to focus better I guess no that's fine I'm not and I'm not discounting yeah. that at all what I suggest is people read it at home before they go to mass to yeah. now what we used to do now we're into this this bible study here but what we what we do uh, most of the time is we actually do the readings for the weekend when we're not in a study like this you see and so what has happened is those who have gone to bible study we've had an unpacking of the scripture so to speak and so when they go and they hear it again they can now have a little bit more of an understanding of what was going on you know but uh, i'm not i'm not faulting anybody that, that, that reads it you know at mass no not at all but 
uh, my thing is I want to make sure that people are really taking it in. You know, they're really taking it in uh, uh, so that the word of God touches them. As Mary pondered these things in our heart, in her heart, well, perhaps we can find some things that we take and that we ponder in our hearts from what we've either heard or as you're saying, Amy, you know, um, that you've read. I mean, I, I'm not faulting anybody for reading, but my thing is take in the scripture somehow or other, take it in. So it just doesn't blow by because some of our readers are uh, you know, well intended, but sometimes it's read too fast. We can't really grasp it. Just phrases like, I will be your God and you will be my people kind of blow by you. It's just something that is said and it should be given more emphasis. And that's a good point too. If you read it before, and I've done that where I've read it before. And then when I'm in mass and one of my daughters is, you know, fussing and I'm holding her or something like that, then I can listen better mm -hmm. without reading. So maybe it's the fact that I need to read it always before we go to mass. And then it's, it's easier to just listen, let it wash over you. So yes. Yeah. And I, again, but again, the key thing here is whatever um, format you choose, just let it come into you. Let it come into your heart, whatever format you use. That's all. So that you take something home with you from that. Uh, uh, from the, the mass that you've heard, the homily that you've heard, maybe there's a good homily or maybe the homily was not so good. Um, uh, we have those two. You know, we have our days. Uh, but uh, whatever message you got, that's the key. You want to you know, you, you keep that in your mind, keep that in your heart all week. Uh, as you meditate on whatever that message was, how it touched you, and how you should be, um, well, how you should be spending time in meditation with that. So uh, again, I I, uh, I praise any way that you hear, listen, read whatever is sacred scripture, but um, uh, I do think that uh, hearing it, you know, again, hearing that come into you. Um, it's kind of like music. It's the music of Christ. So, I, I preached last week, I think it was, I mentioned um, that, uh, you know, that our liturgies and our prayer and whatnot, they have a special language. And what is that language? It's the language of God. That's what it is. We're hearing the language of God. So however we hear that and take that in, that becomes very important for our spiritual life. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yes. Yeah. I, I, like Amy, have been pretty well tied to reading it. I always thought that helped me. But during the pandemic, when we didn't have a book, I realized that I became a better listener because I didn't have that to see. So I had to make sure that was my only way to get it. So there are a couple ways, and both can be utilized to advantage or whatever. I agree. And I think that the, the I think the pandemic, for all of its... Um, challenges that it is still giving us okay for all of its challenges it's still giving us it has um uh opened a lot of windows and doors for us i don't know how i can't tell on my screen how many have signed in today but our bible study has 47 people listed we never had that many people you know, at that bible study um uh the things that we are being challenged to do as becky just said by not being able to have that right in front of you. Now it's helped her with her listening skills, you know, in sacred scripture. You know? So it's challenged us to do things in different ways. And I think there's a lot of beauty to that, uh, that we are no longer set in our ways, that this is this and this is this, you know. And even at the church, uh, all the you know, videotaping of the masses and all of the different things that we do there, we never did that before. And now we are. You know, which means that we've got to prep ourselves a little earlier. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, you know, all our T's are crossed, all our I's are dotted. Why? Because <clears throat> we have a, a good amount of our, um, our church family, our parish family, is still watching us at home because they are fearful, you know, to come to church because of the pandemic. And we never did this. Before. I, I would venture a guess that very few people out there knew of Zoom. Okay. Uh, before now. Uh, I only wish I had a little stock in Zoom before this happened. I think that would have been nice. But everybody's using Zoom. And even our classes this semester, I taught all of my classes on Zoom. And what happened was, was the, um, the attendance grew because it was more convenient for people. So our classes were larger. And 
around the diocese, we were doing that. Where in the past, we never did that at all. We, we just we didn't use it. You know, we went to the classroom, rain, snow, sleet, or hail. We drove out to wherever and did it. And now with this, with technology and us learning the technology, the pandemic has um, has challenged us to think of new ways to bring the word of God to the people. And so there are some benefits. Uh, would I want to see another pandemic? No, absolutely not. But uh, I think that this pandemic has caused us to really think about how we do things. And I like Becky's uh, comment that, yeah, now, you know, she's, she doesn't have it right in front of her. And so she's fine tuned her listening skills. Yeah, okay, fine. They, and I'm sure there are many, uh, there are a lot of people out there that did that the same thing. They fine tune their listening skills and they're paying attention. I know they're paying attention to the mass because I do get emails as to, uh, you know, um, you know, why do you do this and why do you do that and you know why do you do the other and even some of our non-Catholic brothers and sisters that uh, watch us they've emailed me with some very very wonderful questions about our liturgy. You know, one of them was, you know, when you come in on a Sunday, do you just decide, well, today I'm going to wear green? And I said, well, no, that's not the way it works. You know, we have liturgical colors. You know, uh, and uh, another person uh, wrote to me and said. Who is that man that follows you around? And I said, well, that would be the priest. <laughs> so, you know, we've had some comical times with my uh, non-Catholic friends, but they asked some really, you know, and what is that thing that's smoking? He sh he's carrying something that's smoking and he's shaking it. What is that? You know, and it's really uh, amazing to see that, uh, and even our Catholic brothers that are writing to me with a lot of questions as to why do you do this? Or what was that? You know. Uh, I even got that, that people have noticed that uh, I will take my glasses off uh, for a time during the mass because I'm not reading anything. You know, I, I can see a distance of up close is difficult. And I've gotten many suggestions on how to keep my glasses from fogging up while I have a mask on. You know, so, 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 so people do watch, they may watch it very, very carefully. You know? So um, we're very happy about that. And a week doesn't go by that I don't have, you know, at least a half a dozen messages or whatever. Of making uh, positive comments, you know, about the mask or, at, or mask rather, or asking questions, and even from our brothers and sisters from uh, the foreign countries that are joining us, we have people from Uganda in our study today, and Nigeria and Pakistan, and uh, again, they will question, "How come you do this? We do this this way. Why do you do that?" And it's been a quite a learning experience for us to be able to reach out across the world uh, to all different uh, denominations as well as the, you know, our Catholic brothers and sisters to explain what we do and why we do it. And I go back to, Be to Becky's point where because of the situation, if they're following us on the internet, on, on YouTube or wherever they bring us in, they're focused more and they're watching more. And, you know, their, their attention is called, why did you do this? Or, you know, why did the, the priest do that? Or, you know, what's happening with that? It's causing them to look into it more and pay a little bit more attention to our movements around the altar. Why do we do what we do? So, so in that respect, it's been a benefit for all of us. And certainly, uh, and I report to Pope Father Dave as well. I give him updates on uh, the different uh, uh, emails I get, you know, uh, just as to the questions and whatnot. And it's brought us great joy to know that people are being touched by the work that we're doing, what we're trying to do, trying to get the mass out there, or even all during Lent with all the devotionals. And, all the things that we have on the website uh, that was very helpful to people. And so it's caused us to keep that website alive by looking for other things that we can bring out there. So, so that's